Double Faced is a is a hard song. It's a it's a very hard song. What's up everyone? Today we'll look at Double Faced by Tigar Hamasian as a part of the assignment I gave you last week. So gather all your fifth grade excuses for why you didn't do your homework and uh, let's dive in. I'll be breaking this down using the guest versus host method I've discussed in this video. So if you haven't seen it, go watch it. We'll uh, wait for you a sec. Okay, okay, life is too short for that. Let's go. The section we're going to discuss today was almost written for us to analyze using the system, as we have a riff that repeats four times, where in each repetition some elements jump from one side of the table to the other. I'll skip the opening riff, though it's very interesting, and I'll cut straight to the chase. This section onwards. The first thing I need to do is figure out what two numbers are interacting with one another. Usually, one of them would be the time signature, but sometimes it's tricky to find it. In some cases, like this one for example, finding the subdivision may be an easier start. This song is difficult for two main reasons. The polyrhythm here is not the easiest and the tempo is mega fast. So I'll slow some stuff down. If it's too hard to catch the subdivision because the section itself is confusing, I usually try to figure it out through a steadier section. During the intro, I get this quarter note feel that gets reinforced by the hi-hat in the next section. In most cases, the subdivision won't change within the song. It happens, but not too much. So if you go to a simpler section and find out what the subdivision is, you can go back to the difficult one and assume almost 100% that it'll be the same. Check, but it's almost certain. I hear a 16 note subdivision, so I hear something like that. So one of the sides will be that. A basic subdivision of four. Back to our section. The piano is playing this repeated rhythm. And if we slow it down a bit... We get a grouping of five. Not a quintuplet, but a grouping of five sixteen notes. So now we have both sides of the polyrhythm. We still don't know what the time signature is, but we'll get to that later. These are the instruments that we have. Piano, bass, and drum set. But remember that the drum set is actually a few separate instruments. Kick, snare, and cymbals. Oh, and voice as well. Let's start listening. This section mutates as we go on. It repeats four times, and each repetition has a different balance between the musical elements. Number one. The piano plays that five pattern on the right hand and chords that emphasize that five on the left hand. So the piano is here. The bass doubles those chords, so the bass is also here. The drums are split. The hi-hat or stack plays the same pattern the piano plays, so also here. But what about the kick and snare? What are they up to? They play a pattern that looks like this. Snare, K, 
kick, snare, and rest. And between each hit, we have eight 16 notes. So basically half notes, which means they are the only ones on this side for riff number one. The end of the riff has a short unison where all instruments join the five team, but it's pretty short. Small disclaimer, I hear the snare as beat 1, which means once the riff starts, it starts with a snare, that is beat 1 for me. I know that some people would assume that the gap before the snare, that would be beat 1, and the snare would be the backbeat, which it usually is, and it might actually be the backbeat, but I hear this totally as beat 1, so I'm going to be referring to it as beat 1. This doesn't really, really matter for this breakdown, because the polyrhythm we're talking about stays the same in both ways. Riff number two. Here the piano is playing a melody, doubled by the voice. Both of these are still on the five side. On the left hand, the piano is playing these stabs, an accent on every first note of the five grouping. So it definitely stays on this side. The bass, again, doubles the left side of the piano, but drums. Drums are always the troublemakers. The snare keeps playing the same role, but the kick now flips sides and joins the bass and the piano, playing those stabs in five, while the hi-hat, now open and very loud, also switches sides and plays those half notes. Did you feel how strong the hi-hat is once it shifts from the 5 to the 4? How much influence it has on the groove? Does that help you a little bit with the time signature? Do you have any clue what it is? Those half notes are not easily ignored, and when played by the hi-hat, which is an instrument we're used to hearing as the timekeeper, they pop out immediately. This riff also ends with a unison. This unison acts like a kind of a palate cleanser after every repetition. Riff number three. Here, none of the instruments change sides, but the way they play their roles changes. The voice is out. Bye-bye. The piano still plays those tabs in groups of five, but now there is a melody assigned to those hits, which makes the five way stronger. The bass doubles parts of that melody, but stays on the five side. The drums are playing exactly the same part with one slight change. Instead of an open hi-hat, the crash is played. The crash is a bit less sharp and loud than the hi-hat, which weakens the four side. This fact, in addition to the melody in the piano, shifts the power towards the five a bit more. Last repetition, hashtag a number four. This one is terrible. The voice is back, singing that melody in five with the piano. Bass, well, you know what the bass is playing. The hi-hat now betrays our four side and rejoins the five side, playing all subbeats with an accent on every first note of the cycle. The drummer even throws in a few crashes on those stabs in five that make this side just brutally powerful. The kick is still playing the same stabs with the piano. The snare is all alone, cold and alone, playing those same half notes. Keep it up, man. Whew. We're uh, counting on you. I mean, literally counting on you.
How is everyone doing? Black and white you gave, you're fine? Oh wow, that means you don't have a clue about the time signature yet? If we look at the guest versus host table, it's obvious the five side is stronger. And while it seems like we've finished analyzing the different instrumental parts, we're not quite done yet. There's one thing I kind of ignored till now. The gap. All four versions of the riff end with this silence gap. Even though it's basically silence, it's obviously counted in the time signature, whatever that may be. Remember in the previous video, I said that the total amount of beats is one of the strongest cards we can add to the table? Well, this song is a great example for this. Let's try and count the total amount of subbeats within one repetition of the riff. It's difficult because there's a lot, but there's a way to make it easier. We can count the amount of groups of five that we have. And after that, we can add the beat count for that silent break. That would give us the total of the whole riff. Twenty four groups. Each group is five notes long, so we have a total of a hundred and twenty beats. I hear the gap as eight sub beats. So ta dun tun ta dun tun ta dun tun ta kutuku ta kutuku one. Or slower ta dun tun ta dun tun ta dun tun one two three four five six seven eight one. That's the gap that I hear. Okay, so we have 120 beats coming from the 5 side, plus an 8 beat gap, we total at 128. 128 is exactly 8 bars of 4-4 four four in a 16 note subdivision. And taking the drums into consideration, it's safe to say we're in 4-4. Four four. So we have the answer. The 4-4 four four is our host, and the 5 is the guest. So here's the whole riff, with a click and a counter. Listen to the snare drum holding on for dear life on the 4-4 four four side. But remember, this is my version of counting, so I count the snare as beat 1. Also notice that after 8 bars of 4-4, four four, the riffs always restart. I'll count you through 2 repetitions of the riff, because it's too long. Here we go. That's it folks, I hope this makes sense. Thank you for watching.